Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm sitting in McMinnville, Oregon, at Mysara Winery with Mo Mumtazi, the owner and director of this beautiful winery located here. Tell us, Mo, welcome, and tell us, where are we, and tell me about Mysara. Thank you very much. We're on the west of McMinnville, city of McMinnville. Our farm is on the foothills of McMinnville. Uh, it's 532 acres that uh, we've planted 260 of it to the vines and the rest of the vineyard is in forests, pastures, meadows, reservoirs. And just like it, our practice of uh, farming practice, we uh, like to have a complete ecosystem so therefore we don't need to bring any kind of fertilizer from outside. Uh, we kind of consider our uh, vineyard to be a living thing that provides everything that it needs. Yes, and you were telling me you're certified biodynamic. When did you get certified? We got our certification for the vineyard in 2005 and for the winery since 2007. But we had been pr practicing biodynamics since 2002. And you first started producing wine in what year? Our first vintage was 2001. And uh, I know that obviously we're in Pinot Noir country. Um, in addition to Pinot Noir, what else do you have planted here? We have like about 80% planted into Pinot Noir. Uh, most of it is uh, grafted material except the first 13 acres. But then we also have Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, a little bit of uh, Riesling that we've planted. So uh, just mainly concentrating on Pinot Noir. And what is your total case production? For Mesera, uh, it's like about 8,000 cases, but my daughters have their own label. They do about like 3,000. But then we also make wine for some other companies that uh, either under their label or uh, we defer to it that it was done by Mesera. So. But we, we also sell a lot of fruit to other wineries. So our vineyard is called Mumtazi Vineyard, but the winery is Mesara Winery. And what does Mesara mean? Mesara is an ancient Persian name for uh, winery. It's, it actually means house of wine. But uh, in, in those days, wine was considered to be a very sacred thing. And uh, people went to the wineries not only to enjoy a drink, but uh, also it was really important to seek some wisdom from uh, uh, from the wine poor. In, in our culture, in our language, we don't have a word for winemaker, but the person who pours the wine is very important, either... Uh, used to be like an older man, which I, uh, but a wise old man, so I hope <laughs> one day I get to be wise. <laughs> uh, or, you know, some ladies that they had to have a lot of different uh, knowledge as far as, you know, the tolerance of uh, their customers, as far as how much they were allowed to drink, and they were pretty good in music, and uh, they probably were the same people who made the wine, but uh, uh, as I said, it's just like the wine pourer was a lot more important than the winemaker, because they believe the wine makes itself, so there was no wine, <laughs> <laughs> so-called winemaker. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you're making 8,000 cases. Where can people find your wines? Are they only here at the winery, or can they find them elsewhere? No, we're uh, in about 35 different states, but... Uh, in some of the other states that we don't have a distributor, Total Wine carries us, and we also sell uh, some abroad. Uh, that is how the bulk of our wines go to. Oh, fantastic. So tell me, um, what is your first memory relevant to wine? Well, my dad used to make wine. And he made a great wine, but uh, he thought <laughs> wine was too sacred to sell. So he's probably turning in his grave knowing that I do sell <laughs> wine. <laughs> so from, from childhood, I was kind of exposed to uh, being around wine. Yeah, and there's a long history because you're originally from Iran. Um, so long history of wine growing 
Maybe not winemaking because the grapes make themselves. <laughs> well, uh, actually, wine uh, goes back for thousands of years. Uh, as a matter of fact, in a uh, close to a city that I've been in there uh, in northwest of Iran, uh, which is called Urumiya right now, they, they made wine over 8,000 years ago and they found a, mine, a, a winemaking vessel that uh, fortunately there was some residual of the wine in the vessel and uh, they uh, did a DNA on that and uh, they found out that the grape was, the variety was Zinfandel, believe it or not. Yeah. So it, it goes back uh, for a long, long time in our old country. That's pretty much where the wine originated. <laughs> <laughs> so you were telling me that you had gone to college in Texas. How did you end up in Oregon making wine? Well, initially when I came as a foreign student, I, I went to Texas because uh, there was a good uh, engineering school, University of Texas at Arlington. And after I graduated, uh, then early 78, I went back to the old country and uh, things got kind of pretty bad in there. So in 1982, we escaped uh, myself and my wife while she was eight months pregnant. And uh, we finally, after living in Europe for several months and going back and forth to different countries, we finally made it to the United States in 1983. And then uh, I started working in Texas and then when the building industry in Texas got bad in uh, like 1986, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I, uh, after a year or so, I opened my own uh, trust manufacturing plant. And then uh, in 1990, I sold my share to my partners and moved to Oregon. And uh, we've been stuck in here, which I'm really <laughs> the happy because it really reminds me of like Caspian Sea in Iran, in north of Iran, being so lush and green. So you've traveled around the world a bit, um, lived around the world for that matter. What's one of the best foreign wines you've ever drunk? Actually, when we uh, lived in Spain, I had some really, really great wines. And it was very reasonably priced. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we, I'm talking about 1982, and uh, uh, we lived uh, while we lived in Madrid. Uh, uh, we lived in a hotel in a very good area, but then uh, there was this place that uh, I would go, and uh, uh, there was no label or anything on the bottles, and probably the guy would fill it in with the stuff that he had. And there were some really great. Uh, uh, Spanish wines, uh, pretty reasonably priced. Yeah. yeah. Do you recall um, from anywhere in the world or here what, the mo one of the most memorable wines you've ever drunk and what the occasion was? Yeah, that's actually in the old country. Oh. The uh, uh, Jewish people in uh, Shiraz, city of Shiraz, they uh, they've been known to make this wine that's called Holdar, and. Uh, I recall after graduating, I uh, had a couple of glasses when I'd gone to meet the uh, vice president of the company at his house. He uh, offered some wine, and when I had a couple of uh, glasses of that, by the time I left uh, his place, I really felt like a superman. <laughs> <laughs> I really have never had that kind of experience. So it's just like that, that was really a very uh, memorable moment wow. in my life. Interesting. So if we were to come into your home and go into your cellar, I'm not judging how large it is, but what would we find in there? Wines from where and what varieties and anything in particular drinking really well right now? Well, there's, you know, just like having a winery, a lot of times uh, when people come and visit your winery, they bring a lot of wine. But unfortunately, my three daughters have been kind of taking all the very <laughs> the expensive wines. I, I don't even know what they are or where they are, but sometimes I find it in their place. So the, all the, the good stuff goes to them. You know, I have to live with five women now. That, oh. uh, it's just like I have no voice. They take everything <laughs> that they want. <laughs> so you drink whatever they give you. 
<laughs> well, no, we, we actually, we, uh, I really don't look for how rare the wine has been. And just like sometimes when we have parties and we bring not only some of our wines, but then also what we have in the basement. And uh, there's been a few times but uh, that people were really surprised that uh, how expensive the wine was. <laughs> and like one father reminding uh, his son that this is a $500 bottle of wine. Just don't drink it all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's plenty of different wines that we have, yeah. but mainly Pinot Noir. Well, speaking of Pinot Noir, perhaps there's something else. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? I don't know if we could call it perfect variety. And in, in my lifetime, I've changed to different wines. There was a time that, you know, I really liked Zinfandel. Then when I got introduced to Cabernet Sauvignon, I, I really loved it. But now uh, it's just like those wines are kind of really heavy and bold for me. And uh, I do like Pinot Noir because it's a very food friendly wine. You could uh, consume it on its own or with different food. Uh, so it's just like that's that's at least my favorite. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, we plant uh, quite a bit of that. So <laughs> <laughs> it may not be perfect, but it ranks pretty high right, up there. <laughs> right. And what is your opinion of critics and scores? It's a kind of love and hate <laughs> relationship. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, they have to be there, I guess. But uh, uh, you get pretty happy when you get really high score. But then, you know, just like I actually do realize and understand what a hard job they have to do. Sometimes they go through several hundred wines in the course of a day. So it's just like... Uh, when you try so many wines, your palate is really tired. So I don't necessarily agree with everything that they uh, write. It's just like our, in, you know, normally for Oregon Pinot Noir, they give it five to eight years of aging. And uh, right now, our 2001 uh, that was our first vintage is showing so beautifully. I think, you know, it's just like it. it I, I actually don't put the blame on the critics as I do for the winemakers, because when you try to manipulate the wine, uh, yeah, you could make it to look really pretty for the first few years, but then that wine doesn't age too long. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we don't manipulate the wine and we let the vintage and the nature to take its course uh, it, it just takes a little bit longer for the wine to evolve but when it does it's just really beautiful so the blame goes not only on on the, uh, the wine critics but also the winemakers mm -hmm. so you were just speaking about vintage and and the variation that you have from year to year do you see in the years that you've been here do you see more variation from year to year or more commonalities i mean how how much variation, how much does it play a part? I actually am pretty happy that we are here in Oregon. I think places like in California, it's just uh, the vintages are more of the same because of the climate and the weather that they have. But here in Oregon, it, it really varies. It's just like uh, ever since we have been making wine, certain years, like 2007, which the press wrote it off as the worst Oregon uh, vintage, it turned out to be the most beautiful vintage that we had. Or 2011, in 2013, everything started pretty good, but then uh, right in the middle of a harvest, uh, when people had just started doing the harvest, in eight days we got 13 inch of rain. But uh, it, it's just like when you work with the nature and you understand nature and how to take care of it, you could even deal with some very difficult years with certain things that, you know, you could do. Uh, in, in 2013, which a lot of people didn't even pick their fruit after uh, the big storm, 
I, you know, we normally don't do any kind of irrigation the last month, month and a half. And when it was announced that so much rain is coming, I gave a little bit of uh, water. We normally, uh, for irrigation, we do it about like six hours. But I gave every section about an hour, hour and a half of water, uh, irrigated everything. And my idea was like, because the plants have been so thirsty, if you supply so much, you know, all of a sudden they absorb so much water, they're mm-hmm. going to get split berries. So by giving a little bit of water, uh, we uh, were able to, for our uh, vines, and you know, just uh, holding up real nicely so we didn't get split berries. A lot of vineyards, uh, they, they just like uh, after the rain, uh, because of all the split berries, it became kind of vinegar mm. inside the uh, vineyard. And we waited uh, like uh, a few days after the rain stopped and we did make a, a cocktail tea of valerian juice and rose hips. And uh, so valerian's got affinity with heat and uh, by uh, making the tea and uh, spray that after a few day, days that the rain had stopped, it just, you could see on the plants that they're wilting. So it dehydrated. Uh, the plants from the extra water that they had. And then the rose hip having a lot of vitamin C, it just like brought their uh, sugar level up. So after a few days more, we harvested and it was one of the best harvests we had. It's just a lot of uh, uh, other wineries that they were so nervous about, you know, having to wait that long. Uh, they, they made some of the best wine according to them and uh, I have a very good friend uh, Mark Velosic uh, uh, from San Innocent uh, and he used to just uh, out of a tasting room had put limit of three bottles uh, per customer and so just like sometimes people would bring several friends and you know family so they could get their hand on a case or so <laughs> uh, so it's just like the, I, I guess what i'm trying to say is like knowing how the nature works and understanding it and uh, working with it you could even in difficult vintages whether it's hot or cold or wet there are certain things that uh, if you do have the knowledge you could deal with that vintage so the, the, the wines turn out to be okay wine soundtrack the voice of american wine growers and makers are there any signs or um, omens that you use as a predictor as to what the outcome will be in any given harvest well you normally uh the signs, uh, uh, because in, in our vineyard, we've planted a lot of fruit trees and uh, some of those fruit trees is actually to deter certain uh, uh, migratory birds. And so they go to those like we have figs or uh, blackberries or, uh, you know, like mulberries and things like that. So This is, this is to attract um, all the wild geese you were telling me about? The, not the uh, wild geese, but uh, wild just turkeys. the, uh, the uh, no, mainly for the migratory birds. Ah. Because sometimes the migratory birds come in in hundreds of thousands. I mean, you will literally see one flock going against the other one. And as soon as you think they're going to be colliding, one flock gives away and the other ones land in. And they uh, they could just do uh, a lot of devastation. <laughs> but uh, to deal with that, uh, we're really lucky that we have fish in our reservoirs. So because of the fish, we have falcons, ospreys, and bald eagles all the time roaming around. So the migratory birds that they come in, when they see them, they they go to the next uh, vineyard so they don't (laughs) harm us as much. (laughs) That's great. I mean, this is really uh, one system working together and and it's, I mean, a lot of us know about biodynamics and some people don't know as much, but I know that you're, you know, following the moon and, and and you're really one with the earth and you were telling me that you're evolving past that to a more spiritual level so i'm curious do you go into the vineyards and talk to your vines 
I really don't have any problem to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, somebody admits it. <laughs> well, it, here, here's the thing. Even if you don't believe in that, but when you treat your vineyard or your vines and the whole farm as a living entity, and you respect it, that you try to figure things out, you know, it just really brings the solutions to you. It's just like when the, there's that communication, even if it, well, it does talk back to you, but if you observe it, but it, it's just like this is one way to understand it a lot better and to pay attention. Because if you take the time to talk to your, not only vines, to, to the earth and to everything, every other condition that you have, it, you pay a lot more attention, therefore, you observe a lot more and you need, you do realize how to deal with certain difficulties. Uh, it's just like the plants, if the plant is stressed uh, and it's got, you know, the discoloration and all that, you try to find out what, why that is and try to come up with a solution for that. And then when the grapes come into the winery and they're in barrel, do you talk to your wine or do you play music or sing to it? <laughs> I leave it, uh, that to my daughter. <laughs> and uh, I, sometimes they, uh, in, during the harvest time, they played really very loud music <laughs> that I'm totally against that because I think uh, it just with a liquid and the wavelength when you know you don't want to move things uh, just too harshly uh, <laughs> but it, it's there again it's just the wine being a living thing and paying attention to it uh, your question reminds me of this that just a few years back they did this study and they said that it's just like if you, if a mother, uh, when she's pregnant, if you talk to the baby or, uh, you know, read for the baby, that baby turns out to be uh, much smarter. And some of my friends were making fun of that and saying that these, you know, the, the scientists, they don't know what the hell they're doing. But then I turned around and I told them that, you know, if you think if a mother or parents that they take time to read and talk to their baby while she's still in the tummy, how, you know, effective they're going to be when the baby is born finally. They, they're going to pay a lot more attention. So most likely that baby is going to be pretty smart kid. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's the same kind yeah. of a... And, and if it really does work, what harm does it cause? Right, exactly. <laughs> so tell me, as a wine drinker, getting down to basics, red, white, or rosé? I really love all the wines. I, <laughs> I, I could, as I did say, my preference is uh, Pinot Noir, but I love old dry German Riesling and, uh, you know, just like rosé, we, we, uh, we make some, I don't think financially it's a very wise decision to make, but we make some and our rosé is just absolutely beautiful. So I enjoy that Everything. quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then when it comes to pairing wine with food, do you feel that there are rules to follow or how do you approach selecting the wines you want to drink with your meals? You know, that again, in this country, it's just like something becomes a norm that and it gets spread out and then everybody follows that. Uh, like, you know, white wine with Fish. seafood or just like, like red with steak and things like that. One of the things that we try at our winery for our events, and uh, it was really the idea of my wife uh, when she decided to do that, is just uh, on like Memorial Weekend or Thanksgiving or other events that we have she really wants to surprise people and just mixes different things that people are blown away so the answer to your question no it's just whatever is comes good to your palate it, it's just we've made uh 
wine drinking and wine culture too much of a snobbish thing. And we've intimidated, especially some younger folks that I see that they just want to be proper and do certain things. And I always remind them that uh, trust your own palate. And and I tell them, you know, to know a good wine, uh, you know, wine is either yum or yuck. So <laughs> don't worry about, the, you know, the, the just try to uh, trust your own judgment rather than, you know, relying on s- what wine critics say we, we could see that you know just in a matter of a few years how uh, uh, as far as scoring you know there used to be even for Pinot Noir those very big bold Pinot Noirs to get high scores but uh, uh, I guess finally uh, the critics started paying attention to uh, Burgundian wine and to the people's palate and so they've changed their way of scoring as well. For somebody who hasn't tasted your wine yet, what do you think they're missing out on? I, I really think what, what they're missing is uh, we try to make our wine that's really healthy. Our farming method and our way of winemaking that nothing comes from outside and everything's from within. Uh, it, there again, if you go back in ancient time, uh, there are things that I don't know if we have the time to discuss right now, but uh, it, it's just like uh, it, it was a belief that uh, like uh, in the earth there were gnomes in the in, uh, in the water or liquid on, on dine and selfs for the air and uh, like salamanders uh, for the fire. These were elemental beings. And it was believed that, you know, they, uh, they're they very, very smart, but uh, they have no morality. So trying to connect and understand what they meant is, okay, if you put poison underneath your vines, which a lot of us do, we put all of these chemicals and we've really not only addicted the earth and the water source and the air and everything else, we've really addicted our our own body. So we need to kind of like start doing things that it, it just brings the health back to, uh, to the system. We, what, what I am, what my mission is, is just to produce a very healthy thing. And uh, I, I see that, you know, it's just like even some of our competitions, they're paying attention to that. So hopefully things are going to change for better in future. And if space aliens were to land on your property right now, I, well, I know they wouldn't leave because it's such a beautiful property, <laughs> but which of your wines would you want to present them with? You know, the, the diff, we, we do several different wines. And uh, when I asked that question, I kind of mentioned that they're like all your kids <laughs> and you can't differentiate between them. But one thing that I'm really uh, proud of, uh, which we don't produce a whole lot of it, is our Asha. Uh, and uh, that actually came into production since 2007 that... Uh, my uh, daughter took uh, the w- winemaking task, uh, so I, I'm, I'm proud of all of them. Of but course. you know, just like different times, uh, you drink <laughs> different things. <laughs> so, when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be an engineer, and I became that. <laughs> so that way, I could afford that. You know. Doing a winery <laughs> that I, it's just like a big black hole, but uh, I'm really happy with uh, how things have turned around. It's just something that has brought my family together, and all our three girls work. I don't know if I work for them or they work for me, <laughs> but uh, my wife is also involved. So it's just like we're really lucky, and it's, it's just when people come in here and see what we do and how we do things. It really is fulfilling for me to see that they leave here happy. That's great. Um, I hope you have a little more free time now that your three daughters are running the winery or helping you or taking over for you or however you define it. What do you do in your free time? Right now, ever since my granddaughter has been born, I just love to spend (laughs) 
time with her, but I, I love fishing. I used to do a lot of hunting. I don't do that anymore. Uh, I like horseback riding. Uh, also, up to like a few years ago, we like to go mountain climbing, but with a bad knee that I have, <laughs> I had to put that away. <laughs> but I still, I, enjoy, I love traveling. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I really enjoy, being able to go to different countries. And I just cannot wait till I get the chance to go to certain places that I haven't been there yet. What's at the top of your bucket list to go explore? Amazon. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, Amazon. I love to go through the rainforest and everything else and just see. Is there a wine region that's at the top of your bucket list that you want to explore? That I want to? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, of course, the situation is really different there right now but uh, I think the old country it's just the weather that it had it's just like some of the places just being ideal to grow uh, grapes without you know mildew pr pressure or any kind of disease and all that and just like the different varieties of uh, grapes that they have I would love to be able to something over there but it's just like right now it's off the limit yeah. you're talking about the old old country right <laughs> so i know that and you may have answered this already but when you look back at your work what would you say is your proudest achievement to date and it may be that you just answered that about your daughters working here but i don't know if it's that or if there's something you want to add well, uh, you know, in, in, in my other business, uh, we've done over, just here in the state of Oregon, over 10,000 projects. And I'm really uh, proud that none of the things that we designed and manufactured had any problem. But the, the main thing that I have done that I'm really extremely proud of is just like the idea of uh, the farming and not bringing anything from outside. And everybody thought I was an idiot for doing that. It really, they did. They, they thought I was just absolutely crazy. And there's a lot of people kind of like betting how quickly we're gonna go out of business. It's just, you know, everybody thinks that to feed the population, uh, in this time and age, you have to use chemicals or f mineral fertilizers and things like that. Uh, I, I'm really proud that we completely, anything that, you know, just like other places would go to waste, we've turned it into compost, we've turned it into providing things that the uh, farm needs. That's, that's really my achievement but I, I I'm really hoping that uh, and it doesn't take one person it just takes a lot of educators journalists here like yourselves and uh, retailers restauranters that we bring back the idea of the, the food that we consume the, the same you know the expression that's in English you are what you eat so I, I'm really working towards that to convince and I, I really uh, just in the last several years I've seen a lot of younger generation that they don't have too much source of income but they want to consume good things uh, it's it just hopefully you know we, we change the way that we've lived and we've done Done things in the last couple of hundred years. Is there any particular piece of advice you were given along the way that's been one of the most useful? Uh, I have to think <laughs> about that. Well, uh, my uh, my dad was a very wise man, and uh, he always said, "If you have a problem with somebody, do one thing." And he said, "Put yourself in their shoes and ask them to do the same thing." And uh, I've really applied that, and uh, it's really helped if there was any uh, problem with anybody, you know, when you suggest that to them, and, and so you make them think. So that, that was... That's uh, very, very thought-provoking. <laughs> I like that. And if you could give a piece of advice um, to give us our list and our listeners, what's the best piece of advice you'd want to share? I think I already said that. <laughs> I just like uh, that uh, 
wine being either yum or yuck, you know, you just like mm -hmm. trust your own uh, palate and uh, don't pay attention to the snobbery and uh, enjoy life. It, the wine is something to be uh, really enjoyed uh, and, and just like uh, in, in the ancient time people really respected the reason that wine was so sacred because it was considered as to be like a, a liquid embodiment of the sun's radiance because they the older generation they really respected uh, the heavens mm -hmm. that you know the realm of light the it's just like that was really important so enjoy enjoy your life and enjoy you know your drinking but do it moderately <laughs> <laughs> so mo tell me complete the sentence for me a table without wine is like it's like the plate uh, the food wants to jump out of a plate <laughs> <laughs> you, you understand what i'm saying yes yes <laughs> Yeah. If there was one person in this world, living or deceased, famous or not famous, that you would want to be drinking your wine, who would you want to see with a bottle in their hand? Omar Khayyam and Hafiz. You know, just Omar Khayyam, you know, people know him as, as a poet, but uh, he was a mathematician, an astronomer, and the knowledge that guy had during that time, and then Hafiz being just... Uh, in love with wine and and uh, in his poetry he had to be so careful uh, that uh, he he said that he was talking mystically when he talked uh, he, he said he was talking about divinity when he talked about wine but so clear what he wanted he just loved the wine and he wanted to drink it so i would love to have the, both of them <laughs> to drink my wine if i could i like that so I want you to tell me, if you were being sent to a deserted island, what three wines you would want to take with you. For white, I would take uh, dry Riesling. Uh, I would also take Pinot Noir and Zinfandel. Ah. Yeah, I love Z good Zinfandel. So now I'm going to challenge you, the one challenge. Um, I want you to pair those wines with music. What would you want to be listening to or what does it make you think of? When you think about drinking a dry Riesling from Germany, what would you want to listen to? Probably the Major Figaro by uh, uh, Mozart. And what about that Pinot Noir I'm assuming from the Willamette Valley? Possibly yours, possibly another, but I'm guessing the region. It's funny you ask this because last night I was listening to Moody Blues. So <laughs> that, that brought the, uh, the memories from the 70s. Okay. That finally made me dead. <laughs> I like that though. And then for the Zinfandel. Pink Floyd, maybe. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm the, the child of the uh, 70s, you know. <laughs> Good music to listen to. <laughs> well, Mo, thank you so much for joining us today. But before we go, can you just remind our listeners where they can find you? Can they come and visit? Tell us, you know, where to find you and a little bit about your property. We're uh, in southwest of McMinnville in the foothills, uh, about like nine miles away from the city of McMinnville. And uh, we are open. Uh, our tasting room right now is open seven days a week. And our wines are in uh, 35 different states, but then also total wine uh, carries us. But some of the special wines that we make that we don't distribute it through the distributor, it could always be ordered online. Well, fantastic. It's a beautiful property. Um, all the building is made with materials from your property. Um, and old oak staves and things like that. So it's definitely worth seeing the winery. Uh, the tasting room feels like kind of a, a cave. It's very warm and inviting. So I hope more people will come on up here. Thank you very much. I'd love to have people coming out and see what we have done. And it's just really rewarding to see people when they come here. They leave very happy and very amazed. Well, thank you, Mo, and have a wonderful day. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.